Thanks for folks that are coming in. Um, welcome to Open Office Hours. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Tom Murray, and we're just waiting a minute. We're still a little bit early, so give Dr. Murray a few minutes to um, log in, and then we will get started. Oh, here he is. Okay, great. Hi, Dr. Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be here. So um, this is a real treat and always fun to get different perspectives. So um, I know that you've recently written a book um, called Making Naughty with Nice. And, and it's an intimacy guide for sort of rule-oriented, color within lines people. So I think we probably have a few folks who can identify with that. Um, so maybe you can start off by telling us a little bit about what made you write this book. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I wrote Making Nice with Naughty after I had um, observed in my clinical practice as a sex therapist, this uh, common theme uh, among people with intimacy problems. And that was that they were very rule oriented. They uh, had strong feelings about how the world should be, must be, and have to be. Uh, they were particularly planful, um, uh, organized, et cetera. But it also translated into sexual problems, right? So for example, an orgasm is literally the loss of control. And for a lot of people who are over controlled, that is they have, they have an excess of, of self-control, too much self-control that can in, in, in impede their ability to have a good time and to have fulfilling and meaningful relationships. So I wrote it, I, in fact, during the pandemic, I had this question that just popped in my mind when working with a couple uh, that I, I thought I, bet I could predict whether a couple's uh, sex life was satisfactory by just asking one question. Are you a be careful parent? Be careful. Or are you a have fun parent? So when that child was going to take a risk, is your tendency to be, be careful? Or is the tendency to have fun? And, uh, and that really was uh, s some of the impetus for writing Making Nice with Naughty. That's, that's something that's so simple and probably resonates with so many people that we can kind of quickly identify ourselves as a be careful parent or a have fun parent. Yeah, I think yeah. That that's something that, um, yes, I, I totally relate to that and feel like I, I feel myself like, be careful. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And say, yeah. okay, um, you're 16, and I hopefully, if I'm doing my job as a parent, you can make some takes, learn how to take some risks, That's some safe right. risks. So That's that right. that resonates a lot. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you mean by making nice with naughty. So probably people could probably fill in the blanks a lot of ways here. So maybe you could tell us exactly what you're thinking about with that phrase. Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, particularly with over-controlled people, and let me just talk about over-control as a temperament. So uh, temperaments are just stable ways, stable parts of your personality. And, and uh, two of the most famous temperaments are introversion, extroversion. And so these are, temperaments are neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. They're just, again, stable ways of showing up in the world. And under-controlled is one uh, temperament and over-controlled is another. And I uh, lean over controlled as anybody who goes to graduate school definitely has to lean over controlled and to become doctors, uh, uh, certainly. Uh, but certain disciplines such as engineers and accountants and lawyers and uh, 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 you know, various other kind of disciplines tend to uh, uh, match well with people who are over controlled. Um, so uh, many of us grew up in families where being naughty, being a risk taker, being someone who's coloring outside the lines was uh, uh, responded uh, by, with judgment, right? So they were told, kind of taught that being naughty was bad and that you shouldn't be naughty, you shouldn't inconvenience people or whatever it is. And so that rule orientation, so naughty is breaking the rules. So this idea of, oh, I can't break the rules uh, 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 you know, the idea is, uh, uh, too, is that if I don't break any rules, bad things won't happen to me. And so making nice with naughty is really just, oh, yeah, I can actually be adventurous. I can be spontaneous. I can 
uh, uh, tolerate a little bit of uncertainty if it means having a better time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could, um, maybe we could contextualize this a little bit. So growing up in the South, many people are growing up in fairly religious, sometimes evangelical communities where sure. growing up, the predominant message has been that sexuality needs to be under really tight reins. We are, you know, as girls, we're taught, be a good girl and keep your legs close together, right? Your, your wedding night will be the night you get your virginity lost, right? Or lose your virginity, right? And, and so in, as a gynecologist, I've seen so many women struggle with sexual pain, sexual dysfunction, because they're culturally, socially, spiritually, all the things Sex was bad, 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 be, be a good girl, keep your legs together. And then all of a sudden there's a light switch and you're married and you're supposed to be a sex kitten and know how to perform, right? right. And that's putting someone in a really impossible position. So I'm wondering if kind of what you're talking about making nice with naughty has some correlates to, if we look at the larger social context of folks that might grow up in um, microcultures where sexuality is really not celebrated, or maybe that's not fair. I don't, um, there are a lot of rules put on sexuality. Very, yes. Make people who are in the evangelical community feel like I am shaming them in any way. I'm just um, trying to acknowledge that that seems like a real shift that many women are expected to make that feels um, hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I talk about the purity movement uh, specifically in Making Nice with Naughty uh, because for a lot of people that I see, uh, they've been traumatized by um, the, the purity movement. And just parenthetically, even some of the leaders of the purity movement have now come out in the past five years, maybe 10 years, and talked about how they really regret uh, 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 the the message that they were they were promoting, but when you think about it, if you step back, you know, really the purity movement was an was a, you know, I, I think there were good intentions, you know, behind it, uh, but the the app the the effect of it really is that uh, it it warped people's um, relationship with their own sexuality, so that they were less able to to transition into uh, uh, sexual expression with their, with their partner. And this can be with either gender. I've certainly seen uh, men who grew up in a purity movement and they're just so anxiety filled ar ar around sex because sex was uh, 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 seen as this kind of moral um, uh, violation uh, you know, led for, to you, you know, feared uh, damnation uh, if you did anything that was perverse that you, having sex outside of marriage. And so if you are biotemperamentally over controlled and you grew up in a purity movement, it's like steroids, right? You know, it's like this, oh, I got to I got to follow the, the rules. I got to live within these this narrow definition of, of acceptable uh, so that bad things don't happen to me, but also so bad things don't happen to other people. And so people become feeling like they're responsible for ensuring bad things don't happen to other people, right? And, and that leads you to be very much in your head uh, uh, sexually. And then when, um, you know, like you said, you know, the wedding night, there's the, the expectation is the flip comes on and you're supposed to be a sex kitten, I think you said, it's just, it doesn't work that way. So a lot of our group are midlife women like myself who have teenage children, right? And so when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking I'm 49. So I think the definition of AIDS was uh, changed to include women in 1991, if I'm not mistaken. And so when I started college, right, when you have all those orientations, there was a, a workshop on sexual assault. There was a workshop on STD and HIV. Um, I think there was a racism awareness workshop. I think there was a, um, a sexuality awareness to be welcoming of people of all sexual orientations. And so I think sometimes, like you say, when people have really good intentions, right? They were trying to teach us to have safe sex, to have consensual sex. Right. Some of us left that week of orientation as a freshman in college with, 
oh my God, I'm going to get raped. I'm going to get a disease. I'm, you know, I'm going to, you know, all the things. And so I'm wondering if you have this maybe really helpful perspective with this audience of maybe potential some of us are parents of teenage children that are trying to maybe do a good job about having these conversations with our kids. We, we want to have the be careful and have fun, right? So how can we give some of these be careful messages with love and compassion without, without maybe, um, with allowing for some happiness and some expression and sexuality and have it not all be about disease or harm? Well, it's, a, it's that, that uh, the fear-based model versus the pleasure-based model. Uh, the, the literature seems to be quite convincing and clear that uh, early on sex education uh, uh, prolongs first sexual episodes. So, the, so mm -hmm. when, when people have adequate sex education, they're less likely to have sex at an early, early age. Uh, and so, you know, the, my preference is that these conversations have already begun. You know, I'm, I have uh, uh, two teenage boys, and we're, we're uh, those those car rides are always opportunities to talk about consent and to talk about pleasure and and um, those things that are age appropriate. And so, uh, when you're you're, uh, I'll give you an, a, another example. Uh, asking someone. What's the primary reason people have sex? If your if your answer is procreation, mm -hmm. then that is a very limited uh, definition, right? The primary right. reason people have sex is because it feels good, right? And and so it's it's a a, a way to have a connection with another uh, uh, person. Again, hopefully if it's a, a, a adult and 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 consensual, and so. Um, Framing it as a as a thing that people do to feel good, whether with themselves or or, or with another consenting person, is just so important. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can talk about other things. Like again, I talk. I have two boys, but uh, uh, we've talked about menstruation. We've talked. To, we talk about kind of what is the uh, uh, female presenting person's experience, right? Even if you know one of them, you know, just is a, a gay or or by, you know, I think it's still important to, that we have as much information about human sexuality uh, across the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So thanks for allowing me to deviate for a minute. I just, I felt like you were really in a, a, an expert seat to sort of give us some advice on that. So yeah. we were sort of talking about making nice with naughty and kind of this over controlling temperament. So maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more. And, um, you know, maybe maybe even some suggestions for people who identify with that, how they can kind of, what would be some ways they could kind of open that up and maybe let go a little bit? Right, right. So the over-controlled temperament is by and large considered um, the rule-oriented. So having strong opinions about how the world should be, must be, and has to be, uh, feeling uh, often morally righteous or just real, real convicted around right and wrong. Um, they tend to plan and over rehearse. Uh, they are detailed oriented. They're reliable, responsible. Think of, these are all virtues seen in our society, right? These are these aren't things that are are bad, but uh, are widely regarded as virtues. Um, they're the ones, over-controlled people are the ones that go behind their partner to rearrange the dishwasher because it wasn't done right, right? Uh, uh, I don't like anybody folding my laundry because I want it done a certain way. You know? So the, all of this uh, 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 leans or, or it seems to indicate someone who's over-controlled. Now, there are two subtypes. There's the overly disagreeable, which, who have a need to be right, and then there's the overly agreeable who have the need to be liked. So if you can, so if you think, if you're thinking, oh yeah, I'm definitely over controlled. Well, which kind of over controlled you are is important information relative to making nice with naughty. You know, particularly how you're connecting with your partner. So, uh, uh, you know, you can imagine someone who's who's uh, overly disagreeable may struggle in intimate relationships 
where compromise or collaboration and coordination are important. And that's not sexy. If someone's constantly having to be right, you know, that's not really much of a turn on. Right. The overly agreeable may show up in uh, problematic is because they may um, uh, uh, undermine their own pleasure during sex, thinking, oh, I have to get my partner off. My partner's orgasm is more important or whatever their needs are uh, is, is more important. And so they tend to um, uh, uh, be less, they tend to be more performance focused relative relative to sex rather than uh, pleasure focus. And so to what degree, you know, to, to, be, to manage this, one has to ask themselves, uh, uh, to what degree is anxiety really fueling how I'm showing up as a sexual person? Uh, you know, people with, uh, who report low sexual desire, for example, uh, they may be uh, uh, filled with anxiety because they're thinking, oh, all of these rules, things have to be in a certain way in order for me to uh, uh, feel comfortable to have sex, right? So uh, uh, those who are able to make nice with naughty are able to say, you know what? This is really a me time. I want to have a good time. I want to enjoy myself. So I, the dishes are going to be there afterwards. I, you know, I can pause that so that I have this moment with myself uh, uh, even if someone else is present, right? So we want to have pleasure. We want to be pleasure focused in the sense that we're really interested in, in the question of, am I having a good time? And starting there first, if you're having a good time, then that helps you to maybe be a little more interested in whether the other person's having a good time, but it, their pleasure is their business. Your pleasure is your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so let's just kind of explore that for a minute. So if you have someone who's kind of this more over-controlling temperament and they're acknowledging this and want to maybe explore creating a little bit of space, like could you kind of talk about some ways that someone could sort of dip their toe in the water a little bit to be a little bit less controlled. Like if, if people are listening to this and they're really identifying, but part of being an over-controlled person is that this is your safe space where you control things. Can you give some suggestions about small ways people could experiment with letting go of control? One, one is that a lot of over-controlled people don't even masturbate. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, if you grew up in the purity movement or, or uh, uh, other family systems that uh, uh, shamed self-pleasuring and, and uh, uh, you know, you could just put a, a strict rule down, being, learning how your body uh, uh, operates or experiences uh, pleasure is so important. Mm -hmm. So starting there, you know, uh, just when you're by yourself exploring how your body works, is 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 so important um it to 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 really begin making nice with naughty one must have to ask themselves what is the rules that my my that i believe have to be in place in order to have a good time some people say oh i can only have sex uh, uh on saturday it can only happen between three and four o'clock or you know the some people can be very regimented about it and well what would happen if I changed it up a different time. Right. Or some people are like, uh, I will only have sex if my partner pursues me. Or other over-controlled people are like, I will only have sex if I initiate it because I want to, I want to be in control of this, right? Well, mm -hmm. you know, is there room for some relaxation around those rules uh, uh, so that more spontaneity and 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 mystery can be built into it right so it can be just a little bit i think that um i think i was at ishwish which is international society for the study of women's sexual health and they said most americans have sex on saturday night between 10 and 11 p.m right like it was just so interesting like and, and in working with women sometimes you know people will say i'm really tired and i said what about Saturday morning sex? You know, maybe Saturday morning sex post yoga, you're stretched out, you've had some movement. 
And then, then it's like this light bulb goes off, like, oh, I never thought about Saturday morning. <laughs> I'm like, okay, That's great. Right. That, was, that was easy, right? So yeah. Yeah. just small little tweaks to kind of create a little bit more space. That's a that's a great example. Uh, another one is um, I just had a, a, a client right before here uh, who um, kind of bought this this message that um, uh, they 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 should have or they should want to have sex, right? They should want to have sex, and and but they they struggle because they don't feel a want, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and you know, with some further exploration, they bought into this myth that there's only one type of desire and that's spontaneous desire. So they bought the myth that, sp that spontaneous desire is the only type that matters. It's the only right one. And, uh, and since they don't have spontaneous desire, something must be wrong with them. So educating them that there are actually other types of desire, such as responsive or reflective uh, or contextual desire, um, helps, to, helps to have some psychological flexibility so that the question may, it shifts from, do I want to have sex to, am I willing to have sex? So if I'm willing to have sex, in other words, am I willing to be turned on now it gives them a little bit more flexibility to explore um, themselves and their partner sexually and allow the moment to create a context where there's uh, a more interest. And so often the, the want is activated because there was a willingness to, to get started. I think that's a really important distinction. And I think, I think we should spend a little time on it just to make sure people are following you. So typically, um, Spontaneous desire is sort of what we see in the movies, right? Someone's turned on often by something visually sexy and they need zero kind of time to be ready, if you will. And then responsive desire, receptive desire, contextual desire, I think we can come up with a lot of words for it, is that it may take that person 20 to 30 minutes to go from something that they might think is kind of interesting sexually to actually wanting sex. And so, where I think the magic happens, if you have a couple of people with one person is a spontaneous desire person and one person is a responsive desire person, if they have an understanding that this can be a 20 to 30 minutes of exploration with zero expectation and zero yeah. commitment, then often this responsive person has some time to consider if that's something she's interested in or not. That's right. And what I think if there's not an understanding and acceptance of those different desire styles, then often if this spontaneous desire person makes an overture to this person, this person is often saying no, because their brain's like, dude, I'm not there, right? right. And if I respond to you, I'm committed and I'm not ready to commit yet. But if we have this green zone of like, Hey, let's have hang out on the couch and have 20 minutes of canoodling and see if it goes anywhere. But if I don't decide I don't want to, I don't want to put out, well then that's okay, right? We still got to canoodle, that's fine, right? That's so right. I, I love that. I think that we need to do more education that there's a lot of differences in desire styles and they don't follow along lines of gender necessarily, they don't follow lines of sexuality necessarily. They, I mean, I don't know, maybe you could tell me they might even change as our life changes, right? We may oh, for sure. For sure. It, it, and and, and uh, monogamy uh, has with it an occupational hazard. And that is that like you, you're the, the liking your partner on average decreases 4% per year. Lusting after your partner, that kind of sexual charge decreases around 8% per year. Wow. So when couples see me who are in monogamous relationships, they're like, why, why are we just kind of, we're only having sex maybe if we're lucky once a month, right? Uh, and I help to explain to them that for, for a lot of people in monogamous relationships, their partner essentially becomes what I call the beach, right? So if you know people who live at the beach and you ask them, how often do you go to the beach? They'll say, uh, never. And I was like, has that always been the case? No, when we first came down here, we were going to the beach every single day. 
And then what happened? Well, eventually, uh, uh, it was a trade-off. Like I could go to the beach or I could do this thing that, that I need to do today. The beach will always be there, right? And so they find that it's, it's called moral hazard. So they find that they're, they, they put off pursuing their partner sexually or investing in their relationship under the premise, I think, uh, uh, subconsciously, oh, well, the relationship's going to be there. I don't have to tend to the relationship today because the relationship's going to be there tomorrow. And of course, uh, you know, tomorrow never comes. There's always kids. There's always, you know, uh, crises at work. There's aging parents, whatever it is, things that are happening in the person's life that impact their, their sexual readiness. So understanding that, that, uh, our, our life situation can have a huge impact on whether we feel desire. So we talked about um, the Gottman's, uh, the love prescription book, a couple maybe around Valentine's Day. And um, I think it's just sort of wanted to circle back around to kind of what you're saying about that. And one of their points is about, can we remain curious about our partners, right? So I think that kind of concept of the beach is always going to be there and maybe, uh, an extension of that is I know this person, right? Right. And there's nothing new to know here because we've been together for 20 plus years and, and, and this is the same. And I know I'm not the same as I was when I was 26 and I got married, right? I've grown and changed. And, and how can we remain curious about our partners and keep asking some of those questions about, goals like we would be asking when we were meeting them for the first time, right? Yes, yes. That's such an important question. I'm so glad you asked that. Because uh, what we're dis uh, uh, distinguishing between is closeness and intimacy. Hmm. And they're different. Mm -hmm. So closeness is low risk, low anxiety, high predictability, comfort and familiarity. Right. right. So that's closeness, low risk, low anxiety, high predictability, comfort, familiarity. Intimacy is high risk, high anxiety, low predictability, newness and novelty. Mm -hmm. Right. So every relationship, when it starts out, it's all intimacy, high risk, high anxiety, low predictability, all the all intimacy. Of course, that burns really, really hot and it's just not sustainable. And so if you're going to have a long-term relationship with someone, uh, a closeness starts to creep in as it needs to. You need to know who's gonna pick up the kids, who's gonna pay the bills, who's gonna do this, that, or the other thing. And so uh, uh, it starts to creep in. Now, what happens to a lot of couples that I see is that closeness starts coming in and it pushes out intimacy. Mm -hmm. Right. Until you have that old couple at the K and W having lunch and not a word's exchanged between them. All that they have is an unspoken contract to die together. Right. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, nothing's happening. Why? Because as you said, they bought the belief. I already know the person. And so uh, uh, I, I, I educate my couples. You can never know someone. You can only know your story about them, your thoughts about them. You can never know them, right? And, and so that's what intimacy is acknowledging. While it's true, I can never know you. I can know myself better in your presence. And you hear that a little bit in the word intimacy, into me I see. I get to know myself better in your presence. And so at the end of the day, when your spouse comes home and you're greeting them, are you greeting them with fresh eyes? Oh, you are, you are a new person. You had a whole day of experiences. And can they greet you with fresh eyes so that there's that curiosity there? Curiosity is that part of the erotic, right? Is that I, I want to um, unwrap this new gift. I want to see you as a fresh person. And, and, and that um, infuses that erotic element into relationships that is a product of the intimacy. Closeness doesn't have a lot of eroticism tied to it. And when you, when, uh, uh, you see couples where um, their libidos are down, there's very little sex happening between them, it's because actually they have too much closeness. Right. And so sometimes, I mean, I think this is sort of thinking about Esther Perel's book, Mating in Captivity, and that kind of distant gaze. So when you see your partner kind of holding court at a 
cocktail party and they're, they're them, right? They're them away from you. And what are they like? What, how are they in the world professionally, socially, whatever? Um, and, and I think that as, as a, as a woman, who's also a business owner and a mom, right? Kind of how, how are we allowing ourselves the space to be ourselves apart from the marriage, the job, the parenting. I mean, it's not a gendered thing, right? But like, I think that so many women kind of come in with low desire. We've been in relationships for a long time. This is superimposed with some hormonal changes at midlife. Yes. But you know, part of that conversation is what are you doing that fills up your own bucket outside of this marriage that makes you interesting to yourself, but also makes you interesting to your partner? And then are we allowing that partner to have space, time, energy to create what makes that person interesting, exciting, right? And I think that's something that I really had to learn kind of 10 years into my marriage. Like everybody needs to have their own arts and crafts corner, if you will, right? And um, how do we how do we honor the autonomy of the other? That's what, you know, when I hear what you're saying, that's you know, how do we honor the autonomy of the other? For a lot of over-controlled people, uncertainty is their greatest fear. And so they, uh, in order to manage it, they think, oh, I, I have to file away all of the, when I mean file, I mean uh, uh, rub the, the, the edges off, uh, right, uh, of anything that is different about my partner that causes me anxiety. Mm -hmm. So if, if my partner shows up in ways that cause me anxiety, I want to eradicate the difference. But what you are ostensibly doing is creating more closeness, right? Versus celebrating the autonomy of the other, celebrating the difference and using that as fuel for eroticism. So I'm just trying to get really granular, right? So if people are listening to this and they're thinking, I need some space for me and I need to maybe allow my partner to have some space for themselves to become more interesting, to do the thing, to whatever. Maybe could you think about offering people some language on how to ask for that? Uh, it's so it's hard to do that. It's so contextual based because sure. you know, these are, these are uh, uh, dynamics that are so specific. Right. Uh, to that to the couple but you know uh before i think what if there's agreement i, I talk about this in the book uh, around shared values you know having a conversation around shared values so if there's a general agreement that there's something stale happening in the relationship get agreement about that Get agreement about uh, the the value of vitality within the relationship. Does is there agreement between each other that vitality is important and that there's a desire for more vitality? So there's agreement there. Now we can talk about how does that show up in our in, in the relationship. And sometimes it's uh, uh, having shared experiences that are novel. Right. So you can have high risk, high anxiety, low predictability, newness and novelty. You can have those experiences together. So, for example, a lot of uh, over controlled people have an allergic reaction to awkwardness. So they don't want to do anything that's awkward, which would be fuel for closeness. So if you think, oh, I, uh, uh, if I were to develop more tolerance to awkwardness, what would I do? I might take a dance class. So you can go take a dance class, be awkward, right? Be awkward with your partner, have laughs about each other, you know, uh, 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 struggling to get the steps in. And that can be a shared, shared moment. So it, it doesn't necessarily require that things have to be done separate, although that's important. It can also be things done together in a space that's new. So someone's coming with a question and they're saying, asking, how do you keep the curiosity with newness and intimacy separately and together through seasons? Hmm. Uh, well, fundamentally, we're always new. 
right? We're always new. Uh, 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 this may get me into trouble, but I want to use the word objectification. Okay. You know, in, in our modern parlance, we typically think of objectification as bad. Right. Right. Uh, and when, when in actuality, objectification is an essential element of the erotic. Huh. Right. So objectification has to be there, but no one wants to solely be objectified. Sure. Right. But that ability to see your partner as a sexual object is essential for eroticism. But again, no one wants to only be objectified. So when you think about curiosity, what is that? That's an element of objectifying it. I am really interested in this, this person, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to want to look at that person with fresh eyes is one piece. The other piece to the through the seasons, who I was as a sexual person in my teens is certainly not how I was in my 20s, 30s, and now, you know, knocking on 50. Um, and so there's always something new for me to discover about myself as a sexual person. And of course, that's true with our partners, right? They're, they're evolving as a sexual person. What their likes were then may not be their likes now. Uh, uh, and so that's an opportunity to explore each other sexually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think that um, there's a book that's called, uh, what is it called? Hang on, Eve Radosky wrote Fair Play and it's um, kind of about domestic work and figuring that out. But I think she kind of talks about this unicorn space, this space to develop yourself as yourself and how when we allow our partners to have that space, that we can create more intimacy because we are, or we filled up our buckets in some way, right? And so I think that the extension and kind of what you're saying is to be curious about our partners, give them some space to go be themselves and then want to engage with them and learn about what they learned over there, right? And, right. And, right. and continuing to discover that and that gives newness and excitement because they're growing and we're growing and hopefully we're still remaining interested in how that's happening rather than that stagnant couple sitting in the KMW not talking to each other because they they stopped asking each other those really big questions, right? That's right, that's right. And the Gottmans talk about it in terms of updating the love map, mm -hmm. right? If you've been in a long-term relationship with someone and, you know, in that beginning of the, the relationship, you're asking all of those questions. And then you get the answer and you're saying, oh, that, that's going to be the answer for the rest of our lives together, which is, of course, not true. Right. So engaging in those, um, uh, uh, that kind of, that questioning as if it is new and looking for uh, the differences, updating that information, being curious in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um. And so we've kind of talked about several other people's different books, right? We've talked about Esther Perel's book. We've talked about Gottman's book. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how your book is different from some of the other intimacy books out there. Uh, my, my book is the first popular press book that applies a particular type of uh, psychotherapy called radically open dialectical behavior therapy, which is a, a mouthful, R-O-D-B-T, which is specifically designed for people who fall on the over-controlled um, spectrum. And so uh, 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 what I, you know, my readers uh, have told me is that when they're looking through it and they're over-controlled, the, the, the case examples are just uh, uh, reflecting their own lived experience, which is, you know, as any author is just uh, 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 so, um, uh, enjoyable to hear that they're connecting with the material. And so I, I help them to see that their, how their temperament, what their temperament is and how it impacts their sexual and intimate relationships and connecting that these things that are virtues in, in the world out there, if the over-controlled temperament is going to be a problem, if it, if, it, if it is going to be a problem, it will be a problem in people's sexual and intimate relationships. And so then how do we um, manage that. 
And so I, I integrate uh, RODBT with some other approaches um, uh, to get a little academic rational emotive behavior therapy, which is really just this looking at your own mind chatter and, and what, are, what, what is your mind chatter saying? And is it psychologically um, uh, uh, fixed or fatalistic? Or is it psychologically flexible? And, and moving towards a more adaptive um, view so that people are able to ex access uh, a more enjoyable sex and intimate experience. So I'm wondering in your clinical experience, you've been doing this for a long time. Do you find that people tend to couple with a similar, um, like a controlling a kind of person is going to partner with another controlling person? Or do you, do you tend to find that sort of opposites are attracting here? Like what do you, I mean, maybe there's no sort of standard, but do you see patterns that emerge through the course of your experience? Well, in general, there are two, um, there's a, a, a theory about pair bonding and it's the opposites attract or uh, birds of a feather flock together. And so people will have their, their own uh, uh, mating style. They tend to be attracted to people who are different than them. And then other people will want to be attracted to people who are more alike. So, so it can be uh, uh, certainly quite a mix. Now, what I have found, interestingly, is that people who are over-controlled, if they're more over-controlled than their partner who is also over-controlled, they mislabel their partner as under-controlled, when in fact they're not under-controlled, they're just less over-controlled. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, 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 when I'm able to do the assessment and meet with them, I can help them uh, understand themselves better in that way where, where they can still learn the value of some of these, these principles. Now, I love under-controlled people. Even though I'm over-controlled, I love under-controlled people. I love going, you know, if I'm going to a, 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 to a, a bar and I, there, there's a dance floor, you know, it's the under-controlled people who are getting out there. They don't need a drink or, or karaoke. They, they, you know, they're just, they're the first ones up there having a good time. I love watching that. It, you know, I just, if, it, it's so entertaining, but they tend to have much more chaotic lives chaotic. That's my over-control judgment. You know, they tend to have more of that. And I'm like, you know, I love what I'm seeing. I just couldn't be that. So what I have uh, uh, discovered a, a number of years ago is that my, my, uh, uh, I, I benefit from learning how to turn down the volume on my over-controlledness, right? Such as asking the question, if I'm feeling frustrated, uh, which is, by the way, one of the favorite F words of over-controlled people, right, is frustrated. The other favorite F word is if you ask an over-controlled person how they're doing, uh, they'll say, fine, <laughs> right? Even if in the inside they're anxious and depressed, the world out there would never know it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one of the ways that I learned how to turn down the volume on my over-controlledness when I'm frustrated is to ask myself, what rule do I think is being broken here? You know, and once I get conscious to it, then that can be very relaxing, right? I can, I can, I can, oh yeah, you know, there's not, this isn't a, a, a rule for me to die on the hill for. Okay, great. So can you just let people know a little bit about your practice? Some people might be listening and they may be like, hey, this really resonates with me. Dr. Murray seems really warm and approachable. How can I find this person? Can, can you tell us a little bit about how you work with people? Yeah, so uh, certainly people can visit me at a path to wellness.com. Uh, I'm uh, the, the owner and director and I have two additional uh, clinicians. And most of my practice is near exclusively working with couples and sex therapy. I also have a specialization in discernment counseling, which is for divorce ambivalent uh, couples who haven't yet you know, they're trying to decide whether they should or shouldn't uh, pursue divorce. So that's a, 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 a separate specialization that I have. Uh, my, my style of therapy is it's very similar to my presentation style, um, much more interactive. 
and short term. So people, you know, if people need you know, people who want erections or an orgasm, they don't want to be in therapy for years, right? So you know, the same with my couples, they they want to be able to get on with their life. And so I tend to be much more directive. Um, as a couples therapist, I, I uh, inform people that I'm an advocate for their relationship. And so, uh, and I expect them to be advocates for their relationship. I'm not their individual advocate. That's what their individual therapists are for. And so I uh, give a lot of direct feedback that sometimes is a, a hit between the eyeballs uh, rather than um, being fluffy. You know, certainly no one would say <laughs> that I'm a fluffy uh, kind of therapist. I want to get people where they want to go as quickly as possible without any unnecessary sessions. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think a lot of people really are ambivalent or hesitant to consider therapy because they think they're going to be on someone's couch once a week for five years. And um, most of us are busy professionals and we don't have the bandwidth. We don't have the time, money, and energy for it. So I love direct it yeah. to the point, give me a toolkit, let's go, right? Yeah, that yeah. that's exactly right. You know, I think of myself more like a coach to elite athletes. And, and in that model, their success, my patient's success is what defines my success. And so I want them to experience change in their life. You know, therapy, a lot of, a lot of people go into therapy and, and they feel better, but their lives aren't better because life requires action. And so, you know, I'm very much action oriented. Right. That sounds so refreshing. And then I always get Greenville and Greensboro confused. So can you just let people know where you are geographically? And then if they live in Raleigh, are you open to doing sessions virtually? Would you prepare that they, it's only about an hour, right? Uh, I'm, I'm in Greensboro, which is in central North Carolina. And uh, because I'm licensed in a number of other states, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Florida, uh, I do a lot of telehealth, uh, okay. including with couples and individuals. Okay, so people could just see you virtually and they wouldn't have to get in the car at all. That's exactly right. That's exactly Perfect. right. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, it, unless there are any other questions, feel free to pop in questions if you've got questions. Um, but this has been fantastic and really fun. So. Thank you for encouraging us to break out of our comfort zone a little bit and make nice and naughty. You're so welcome. And thanks for having me. All right. Have a great day. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.